there's sometimes when you, you have meetings like the meetings that you have a suspicion in advance that they're going to be special meetings. I have that suspicion, but of course I don't know. This might just be a typical meeting, but I remember one time in Colombia, uh, we had a meeting that began on a, a Friday night like this, and there was, I don't remember anymore, three or four hundred people, and the, um, the brethren let me know that there was some people in the audience, probably about a hundred people, that had just been out of their property in Colombia by the rebels and told they could never go back, and that some of the sisters in that audience had just, in the past 24 hours, watched their husbands get executed. Yet they were at that meeting on Sabbath. I can remember having a meeting in Oklahoma that when I came home, I got out of the car and my daughter was there and my wife was there and they asked me what took place at the meeting. I, as I started to tell them, all I could do was break out into an uncontrollable sobbing. Um, been to a few meetings that have impacts like that on not just me, other people, but it was in a meeting in Georgia where there's a handful of us there that we watched the actual words of the spirit of prophecy be spoken by men. And they weren't good words. They were words that Sister White said would be spoken at the end of the world by men that were going to reject the message of the hour. And they were using it word for word. And you were pinned back in your seat because you, you know that quote. And then you slowly look over at one of your friends that were there and they heard it too. There's Edgar was here. He might remember some of those. So there is the possibility with what's going on here in Newport this could very well, well, well be one of those meetings um, from my perspective. What we've been sharing over the past two or three months, um, from my perspective, this is one of those meetings based upon Jeremiah 11. Jeremiah 11, we'll never get to. Uh, we brought, we're not going to Jeremiah 11, we're just doing a long introduction, all right? Um, we brought, we overnight mailed the series that we did recently. Dario Taylor was at our property and he did some meetings in the daytime and I did morning and evening worship. Uh, they were just finished being produced. Some of you may have watched some of those on the live streaming, but what we recorded is easier to look at. And we sent 10 copies to Bill and Mary and they've handled it, handed them out to some of you and they handed them out to the people that they thought might duplicate them. So if you do not have that series, I would ask you to connect with someone here in this room that has that series and has a duplicator, because that 10-part series is what we're going to be doing here in five parts. So we're only going to get halfway through, but the conclusion of that 10-part series is based upon Jeremiah 11. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about Jeremiah 11 before we begin, because we'll never get there. I believe that you can show that in Jeremiah 11... That there comes a point in time where the Lord reveals to Jeremiah that there is a conspiracy among God's people. And that, let's go there. And that when, when this is revealed to Jeremiah, it's also revealed to Jeremiah that this is where the persecution of Jeremiah is going to begin. If you go to Jeremiah 11, I'm not going to read it all. Um, in verse, let's, it's nice to read it all. Let's read verse 1. <laughs> let's read a little bit of it, all right? We'll, we'll get to our notes in a moment. The word that, verse 1 of Jeremiah 11, the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Hear ye the words of this covenant, and speak unto the men of Judah, and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Cursed be the man that obeyeth not the words of this covenant which I commanded your fathers in the day that I brought them forth out of the land of Egypt from the iron furnace, saying, Obey my voice and do them according to all that I commanded you, so shall you be my people and I will be your God, that I may perform the oath, the oath Amen. that I've sworn unto your fathers. Of course, this oath is the oath that you find in Daniel 9.11. This oath is the oath that is translated differently in Leviticus 26. It's translated as seven times. 
that I may perform the oath which I've sworn unto your fathers to give them a land flowing with milk and honey and as it is this day. Then I answered and said, so it be, Lord. Now, this is a, in the context of Israel breaking the covenant. And in verse 9 it says, And the Lord said unto me, A conspiracy is found among the, the men of Judah and among the inhabitants of Jerusalem. They are turned back to the iniquity of their forefathers, which refused to hear my words. And they went after other gods to serve them. The house of Israel and the house of Judah have broken my covenant, which I made with the fathers. Verse 18. And the Lord hath given me knowledge of it. What Jeremiah is given knowledge of is this conspiracy. This conspiracy where the covenant is broken. And when they break the covenant, they turn back to the belief system of their forefathers. And the Lord hath given me knowledge of it, and I know it. Then thou shewest me their doings, but I was like a lamb or an ox that is brought to the slaughter. And so my point is, is that for Jeremiah, there came a point in time where he, the Lord opened to him the understanding that there had been a conspiracy in Israel. And at the same time that he's given this understanding of the conspiracy, that's when the persecution of Jeremiah begins. And there was a conspiracy in the history of Adventism in the 1930s to turn the foundational truths upside down. And in the recent, say, six months, that conspiracy has been made known to God's people if they're willing to see it. And based upon that understanding, you should expect that the persecution that takes place in Adventism that precedes the Sunday Law persecution should get underway. Okay, so that's, that's the punchline of this study that we'll never get to because we're going to do the first five of ten. Okay. But I think, based on prophecy, they're about to kill Jeremiah. Okay. And the conspiracy was accomplished by W. W. Prescott, A. G. Daniels, and Willie White. All right. so you'll, you'll see the, the argument along that line if you get your, a copy of these DVDs. But where we want to begin tonight is in your notes. Um, do I have a set of your notes? Of the notes? Yeah. I, Did you walk off with it when you were up here? I thought I had him earlier. Okay, thank you. Okay, this, this but another little bit more information about this study. This is the fourth time I think I've tried to do this study. I did it once for our little church family in Arkansas, and then I did it in a more, in a fuller sense, on live stream, and then I did it last week on a weekend in Eatonville. And for me, when I come across the study, I'll put it together, and if, if I have opportunity to share it a few times, it goes through an evolution. What I'm sharing, the last time I share it is never quite the same as the first time I share it. I purposely drop off some things that as I've shared, I realize too difficult to teach that particular point, or it's not necessary to the overall point. So this is going to be, these notes were set in, sent in advance of these meetings. I'm not going to refer to every reference in these notes. I knew that going in tonight. All right. So I want to start in Numbers 14.34, which is on page one of your notes. And I'm going to tell you what I'm going to try to show you this evening before we try to show you this evening. Okay? If you want to look up here. Some of you may know this particular line. This is what we would call the prophetic chain. All right, and by the prophetic chain, we make the case that a chain is built by links, and all the links in the chain are identical. Okay, and Sister White tells us that William Miller was given the commencement points to the chain of truth. At the beginning of Adventism, they were given the commencement to the chain of truth. At the end of Adventism, we've been given the links in the chain of truth. And the links in the chain of truth go from Eden to the second coming of Christ. Sister White have references to the links in the chain beginning in Eden and going to the second coming of Christ. And I believe prophetically, and I'm not going to take the time to prove this to you tonight, but the, links, the link in the chain is the 3-1 combination. 
I begin, you can show three one combination from Adam and Eve all the way to the second coming of Christ. And as you throw, show this link in a chain, you are showing changes in dispensations. So this is part of the prophetic chain. I'm going to jump in the middle of the, or in the beginning of the prophetic chain. I'm passing over the first link, which is Adam and Eve and Christ in the garden, the disappointment of being driven out of the garden, and then Abel. And from there, Noah and his three sons, the disappointment of the flood. And then from there, Moses, Miriam, and Aaron, the disappointment at the Red Sea, and then Joshua being raised up. Okay, those are the, but now I'll take the next link that I, that I want to highlight because I want to make a point about the links in the chain to make a point about our study tonight, and then we'll move away from it. The change of dispensation from a, in Adam and Eve was that they worshipped face to face with Christ, but when they were driven out of the garden, then they would worship at the gates of the garden. And then there's a change of dispensation in the next link with Noah, because now you're not worshipping at the gates of the Garden of Eden anymore. When Noah gets off the ark, you're worshipping at an altar. And the next link of the chain is Moses is being used to raise up the earthly sanctuary, the tent sanctuary. Always dealing, these links are dealing with a change of dispensation, which is an absolutely life and death truth to understand. Okay? It seems that there's some in Newport that do not understand this. But when it comes to the change of dispensation in early writings, page 259, Sister White tells us that the reason the Jews could not receive the blessing of Pentecost and that they were left in perfect darkness is because they couldn't recognize the change of dispensation from the earthly sanctuary to the heavenly sanctuary. And in the next paragraph, she tells us that the reason that the Protestants in the United States ended up directing and having their air, prayers answered by Satan is they couldn't recognize the change of dispensation from the holy place to the most holy place. So when we're talking about the links of the chains marking changes in dispensation. This is pretty important information for God's people at the end of the world because all these links are pointing to the end of the world and it's pointing to the change of dispensation from the judgment of the dead into the judgment of the living, but we don't want to see. Amen. Okay, we don't want to see that. But after Moses sets up the earthly sanctuary, they establish it in Shiloh. This is Shiloh. And these three marks here are Eli and Hophni and Phinehas. And the disappointment is that the ark is captured by the Philistines. And at this time, the Lord raises up Samuel. Okay, the, the earthly sanctuary has been in Shiloh, and now the Lord's going to choose Jerusalem. This is Jerusalem. And this is the first three kings, Saul, David, and Solomon. And Solomon builds the permanent sanctuary. And the disappointment is that the death of Solomon, the kingdom is rent in two. And the Lord chooses Rehoboam. He chooses Judah rather than Jeroboam in the northern kingdom. So when you get to the end of ancient Israel, and I'm saying the end of ancient Israel on purpose, I know that the end of ancient Israel is the stoning of Stephen. But I'm saying that when Nebuchadnezzar destroys Jerusalem, that's the end of ancient Israel. I will explain myself. When you get to the end of ancient Israel, you get to the last three kings, Jehoiakim, Jehoiachin, and Zedekiah. And Nebuchadnezzar deals with all three of these kings. And the disappointment is that Jerusalem is destroyed. The temple is destroyed, and the people are carried into Babylon. The fourth here is Nebuchadnezzar. Are you following me on the links? Okay, so it's on the third king, Solomon, that the sanctuary is built. It's on the last of the three kings, the last, of the last king, but it's a, a set of three kings because all of the last three kings are attacked by Nebuchadnezzar. It's on the last of those three kings that Jerusalem and the temple is destroyed and they're carried into captivity for 70 years and then it's on the third king, the third decree, Cyrus, Darius, and Artaxerxes that they rebuild Jerusalem and the temple. So third king, temple built. Third king, temple destroyed. Third king, third decree, temple rebuilt. Begins the 2300 year prophecy. 1844, the third angel's message arrives and John in Revelation 10 is told to measure the temple and the measuring of the temple is 
a term dealing with the building of Jerusalem, only this is spiritual Jerusalem. So on the third way mark, temple built, temple destroyed, temple built, temple built again here. But what I want you to see is that when Nebuchadnezzar destroys Jerusalem, that this is the end of ancient Israel, in one sense, okay? What, 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 would, what do you usually hear is the end of ancient Israel? The stoning of Stephen. And what happens at the stoning of Stephen? Jerusalem is destroyed. Read Great Controversy. The only reason Jerusalem wasn't destroyed in, uh, in AD 34 when Stephen was stoned is because the Lord in his mercy extended that time period to when? AD 70. So the end of ancient Israel is marked by the destruction of Jerusalem and the number 70. Because in this history, when Jerusalem's destroyed, they're carried into captivity for 70 years. And when Jerusalem's destroyed in AD 70, it's in response to probation closing in AD 34. And Sister White tells us that the destruction of Jerusalem represents the end of the world. Okay, so the destruction of Jerusalem by Nebuchadnezzar here prophetically, is the end of ancient Israel. All right? I hope you can follow me on that. Because what I want to show you is something that, if, if you've been a Seventh-day Adventist very long and you have tried to present Adventism to non-Adventists, then you've had to teach the year-day principle. Because the central pillar of Adventism is the 2300 days, and if you're going to teach the central, central pillar of Adventism, then you're going to have to establish the year-day principle. And the two places in the Bible where we establish the year-day principle is Numbers 14.34 and Ezekiel 4.6. Right? Okay, so I, I have a reason for, for trying to take this a little bit deeper here this evening. This... History, Numbers 14.34, it's the beginning of ancient Israel. This is, this is marking the history when the 12 spies went in to spy out the land and 10 came back and said, we can't do it. And Joshua and Caleb said, we can. So what happened? For every day you were in spying out the land, you're going to be a year in the wilderness. 14.34, so what does that mean? What that means is this. This year day principle is marked in God's word at the beginning of ancient Israel. And it's a history that's identifying the rebellion of ancient Israel. And they were rebelling against something very specific. They were rebelling against the rest. And we'll look at the rest in Hebrews 3 and 4. And at the end of ancient Israel, it once again is marking the rebellion of ancient Israel. Jerusalem was destroyed because of the rebellion in ancient Israel, and this is the end of ancient Israel, and they were, it's very specific what they were rebelling against in that history. What were they rebelling against in that history? The Sabbath. According to Jeremiah 17, Jeremiah tells us that if they had kept the seventh day Sabbath, Jerusalem would have stood forever. So what I want you to see is that when it comes to the year, what we're going to try to show you tonight, this is simply an overview. At the beginning of ancient Israel, the year-day principle is marking ancient Israel's rebellion against a type of rest. And at the end of ancient Israel, it's marking ancient Israel's rebellion against the seventh-day Sabbath rest. And ancient Israel is the most specific prophetic symbol of modern Israel. Therefore, what we're going to try to show you is that at the end of modern Israel, there will be a rebellion against a rest. Stand you in the ways and see. Ask for the old paths. And walk therein where you will find what? But they said, we will not walk therein. And the class that rejects this rest is preparing themselves in the very near future to reject the seventh day Sabbath rest. And this process is identified at the beginning and ending of ancient Israel. 
And there is a, there's a brother that's in this message, and he went to a church one time, and he, he presented the daily, the way the pioneers presented it. And there was a sister that was the head of that little church. You know, sometimes sisters control the church. And she says, I want you to come back next Sabbath. I have a friend that really understands the, da- the daily, and I want you to speak with him. So the next Sabbath, Brother Wesley, those of you that might know Brother Wesley, he went back to this church. And this sister had been good friends with a man named William Shea. And William Shea schooled him for two or three hours on while the, why the daily represented Christ's sanctuary ministry. It didn't shake Wesley at all. But I want you to understand that William Shea, when it comes to this message, I wouldn't think that he's sympathetic with this message. I don't really know. I don't know that much about him. But when it comes to the daily, he's not sympathetic. But William Shea has written and put in print that the first place that you find the year-day principle in Bible prophecy is in Leviticus 25. Okay. So when it comes to the year-day principle at the end of the world, Adventists may not have acknowledged it until the end of the world, but Leviticus 25, the first thing that's introduced, and we'll deal with this tomorrow morning, is the year-day principle. And based upon the rule of first mention, when it comes to dissecting correctly Leviticus 25 and 26, it has to be based upon the year-day principle of Bible prophecy. And therefore, when William Miller understood the seven times of Leviticus 26 to be identifying 2,520 years based upon 2,520 days of disobedience in Leviticus 25, verse 8, he was spot on. And of course, Leviticus 25 is a rest. It's all about the land resting every seventh year and the land resting on the Jubilee. So to reject the 2520 at the end of the world is to be rejecting the foundational truths of Adventism, but it's to repeat this very rebellion here. And if you insist on continuing that rebellion, you're going to end up right here on the wrong side of the issue in rejecting the Seventh-day Sabbath. That's what Bible prophecy is telling me. That's what we're going to try to show you at this time. In your notes, you have Leviticus 14, verse 11, and then 20 through 23. Now, tomorrow, I'll get the whole introduction out of the way, because it's all tied together. Tomorrow, I hope you can all make it back tomorrow. Sometimes when you have Friday Friday night meetings, some people can't make it back because they have responsibilities in Sabbath school or whatever. But tomorrow what we're going to do, after we deal a little bit with the Year Day Principle, we're going to show you that the first prophecy of the 2300 years, the 49 years that it took to rebuild the street and the wall in troublous times, that's the first prophecy of the 2300 year prophecy, right? That prophecy is based upon Leviticus 25 and 26. We're going to show you that. And the second prophecy is the prophecy of 490 years. And we're going to show you that the 490 years of the 2300 year prophecy is based upon Leviticus 25 and 26. And at the end of the 490 years, there's a week where Christ confirms the covenant with many for 2520 days. We're going to show you that that's based upon Leviticus 25 and 26. And then we're going to show you that the 2300 years has to be established upon Leviticus 25 or 26, or it just doesn't mark the cleansing of the sanctuary. Therefore, every component of the 2300-year prophecy is built upon, based upon Leviticus 25 and 26. And if you throw out the 2520, you're destroying the central pillar of Adventism. Once we do that, we're going to show you that that 49 years, the 490 years, the one week, and the 2300 days are prophecies that are fulfilled, not Time is no longer after 1844. They're not fulfilled in terms of time, but all of those prophecies are giving specific testimony to the end of the world. And if you throw out the 2520, and you don't see those prophecies in the 2300 days, then you're blinding yourself to what those prophecies are saying about Adventism at the end of the world. So that's what, that's what we're going to try to accomplish here tonight and tomorrow. First point, we'll look at these histories. Everyone with me? Okay, let's, let's, you can turn to your Bible or you can read it from the notes, Numbers 14, 11. We know this. 
How, how many of you ever taught the year day principle to a non-Adventist? Really? Raise your hands high. Not very many. Well, I guess there's a certain amount. Did you ever tell them the year day principle was a, a marker of the rebellion of Israel? That's what it is. You, you think about it, you know it, right? They refused to go into the promised land. That was a rebellion. They refused to keep the seventh day Sabbath, so Jerusalem was destroyed. Okay. And did you ever think it might be illustrating the end of the world? Okay, verse 11. And the Lord said unto Moses, How long will this people provoke me, and how long will it be ere they believe me for all the signs which I had showed among them? Now, the reason I put verse 11 in, you need to test me. Brothers and sisters, I want you to know that I've read that letter that's went around this town. And from what I can tell, my name's in that letter more than anyone else. And I want you to know that I have a family and I have children and I have grandchildren and they like me just as much as your children and your grandchildren like you. And I have friends. In my last 20 years in Adventism, I've been compared to Jim Jones, to David Koresh, Victor Hotel, uh, Janine Citron. And it doesn't seem very friendly to me that people do that. I'd like, to, I'd like to see them demonstrated in black and white when they're making these claims. But they don't. But I'm forewarning you. You better test everything I said. Because I don't know of anyone right now in Adventism that is getting more criticism about what he teaches than myself. And I'm not trying to lift myself up. I'm trying to, to encourage you to wrap your mind around what I'm going to claim here on this Sabbath. And if it's false, then get on the rooftops and say it's false. All right? This is serious business, brothers and sisters. If what we're understanding about prophecy is true, this is serious business now. How long will this people provoke me, and how long will it be ere they believe me for the signs which I have showed among them? What what God is asking Moses here now, what he's saying is the reason that they are unwilling to enter into the promised land is because they've rejected the signs and the miracles and the wonders that they saw when the Lord brought them out of Egypt. This is an important point because Sister White often compares that beginning history of ancient Israel, the signs, the wonders, and the miracles in Egypt with the Advent movement of 1840 to 44. Amen. So the reason this people isn't going into the promised land is because they forgot what, what went on in 1840 to 44. Amen. All right? That's part of this. That's why verse 11 is in here. But now let's jump forward to verse 20. And the Lord said, I have pardoned according to thy word. Moses intercedes at this point. Don't destroy this people. He says, okay, I won't destroy all of them. The children have opportunity. But as truly as I live, all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord. When's that? That's Revelation 18, verses 1 through 3. Amen. This history is being specifically marked with Revelation 18, verses 1 through 3, if you believe 1 Corinthians 14, 32, that says the spirit of the prophets are subject unto the prophets, this is a reference to the entire earth being filled with the glory of the Lord when the mighty angel of Revelation 18 descends. So, brothers and sisters, the punchline of all this is, is yes, I'm saying that this history here, this is 9-11, September 11th, 2001. Okay, but... Because all those men which have seen my glory and my miracles which I did in Egypt and in the wilderness and have tempted me. Now, how many times? Ten, ten times. What's ten? ten is a symbol of the dragon power, all right? But what's a lion in Bible prophecy? A lion is Babylon. It's Christ. It's Satan. It's Judah. Depends on context, doesn't it? So, yeah, ten, ten represents the dragon power, but what else does ten represent? A test. A test. Ten commandments. Is there another test that you can think of with the number ten? Daniel's ten days. Daniel chapter one. Is there another? How about the church of Smyrna? Weren't they tested for ten days? 
Okay, so this is representing a testing process of 10 times. It's, it's the 10th tenth, tenth, tenth test for ancient Israel after they came out of Egypt where they fell and they, they're going to go wandering in the wilderness for 40 years. Now, this is worth paying attention to because all these prophets are speaking more about the end of the world than they are their own day, including Moses. When Adventism rejects the old paths of Jeremiah, they're rejecting the tenth test. But, and have not hearkened to my voice, surely they shall not see the land which I swear unto the fathers, neither shall any of them provoke me see it. Now let's go to Hebrews chapter 3. We won't read all this. We all know this, I would assume, the Seventh-day Adventists. Hebrews 3 and 4. Three verse seven says, "Wherefore the Holy Ghost saith, Today, if you will hear His voice, harden not your hearts, as in the day of provocation, as the day of temptation in the wilderness, when your fathers tempt me, tempted me, proved me, and saw my works forty years. Wherefore I was grieved with that generation, and said, They do always err in their heart, and they have not known my ways." Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief and departing from the living God, but exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin, for we are made partakers of Christ. How, how are we made partakers of Christ? Through suffering? Okay, here, we're made partic- partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. And we're going to read some quotes from the Spirit of Prophecy. The beginning of our confidence that we're to hold to the end is represented on these two charts. Amen. All right. These truths. If you don't hold on to these two charts, then you're not a partaker of Christ, according to Paul. Here. For some, when they had heard, did provoke, howbeit not all that came out of Egypt by Moses... But with whom was he grieved forty years? Was it not with them that had sinned? Verse 19. So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. Verse 1 of chapter 4. Let us therefore fear lest a promise being left to us of entering into his rest. Any of you should come short of it. Um, Verse 11 of chapter 4. Let us labor therefore to enter into that rest lest any man fall after the same Example of unbelief. And I know that as Seventh-day Adventists, when we teach chapter 3 and 4 of Hebrews, we're teaching non-Adventists that there remaineth a Seventh-day Sabbath for the people of God and that God's people are to keep the Seventh-day Sabbath. But this isn't the rest that Paul is primarily referring to. And this is not how Sister White defines this rest. In your notes, you'll see one place where she defines this rest. She says... Those uh, who are unwilling to give the Lord faithful, earnest, loving service will not find spiritual rest in this life nor in the life to come. There remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. Let us labor therefore to enter into that rest, lest any man fail after the same example of unbelief. The rest here spoken of is the rest of grace. And it was, not, it was not that long ago where I had a, a strange idea. I get strange ideas, and then I go test them with the Bible and Spirit of Prophecy, and I was dead wrong on this one, all right? I came into, I just, you know, you're dealing with the latter message and what the latter me- means in your, your mind or in your studies. So it just struck me, it came into my head, those people that have a form of godliness and deny the power thereof, and all the prophets are speaking about the end of the world, therefore there's a group of people at the end of the world that have a form of godliness but deny the power thereof. Well, obvious for me, the power they're denying is the power of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. So I went to search it out in the spirit of prophecy, and I was dead wrong. Okay, The power thereof, for those of us that have the form of godliness but do not have the power thereof, you know what the power of 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 it is? Well, grace is the way to say it, but it's obedience. The power is being obedience to God's word, which I agree is grace. All right. But I want you to see, though, here, Paul in Hebrews 3 and 4, he's referring to specifically to this rebellious history, and the rest that they rejected is the rest of grace or the rest of obedience. They could have went into the promised land, but they rejected it. They had all the evidence they needed 
They watched the Lord bring them out of Egypt. They hadn't developed the faith. And they rejected the rest of grace. Okay? So uh, at the beginning, it's the rest of grace. Are you with me? All right. Next page. Dealing with laboring. But through their own course of rebellion, this is Review and Herald, October 21st, 1890. But through their own course of rebellion, the blessing of God towards Israel was turned away from them. That which they had sown in questioning and unbelief, they had to reap. The record says, have you ever went through, have you ever noticed that in Numbers 14.34, when they failed to go in the promised land, that as we read, they had rejected the Lord ten times, they'd failed ten tests. Have you ever noticed that before? Once you notice it, you know what you can do? You can go back in from Exodus to Numbers 14, 34, and you can count the ten rebellions. They're there, black and white. And it's enlightening. We've been doing that in our, in our worship in Arkansas in the morning, for the, primarily for the youth that are helping out there. And those ten tests that they failed, you can line them up with the history of Adventism right down the line. Thinks, you would think that's something that we'd want to know. <laughs> okay. Or that we would already know. But through their own course of rebellion, the blessing of God toward Israel was turned away from, from them. That which they had sown in questioning and unbelief, they had to reap. The record says, but they rebelled and vexed his Holy Spirit. Therefore, he was turned to be their enemy and he fought against them. May the Lord forbid that the history of the children of Israel in departing from God and refusing to walk in the light and refusing to confess their sins of unbelief and rejection of his messages should be the experience of those people claiming to believe the truth for this time. For if they do as did the children of Israel in face of warnings and admonitions, the same result will follow. What was the result here? They didn't get to go into the promised land. They died outside the promised land. Why even be a Seventh-day Adventist? Why be a Christian if you know you're going to die outside the promised land? Is that a bad question? It's a real question. The same result will follow in these last days as came upon the children of Israel. The apostle admonishes, admonishes today if you will hear his voice harden not your hearts as in the provocation in the day of temptation in the wilderness when your fathers tempted me proved me and saw my works 40 years wherefore i was grieved at that generation said they do always err in their heart and they have not known my ways. so i swear in my wrath they shall not enter into my rest now comes the warning of the apostles sounding down along the lines to our time take heed brethren lest any of lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief and departing from the living god but exhort one another daily while it is called a day, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. So I want the spirit of prophecy to define that for us now. Testimonies, volume 8, what the beginning of our confidence is. These things are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. The warning comes sounding down, along to the, down the line to our time. Take heed, brethren... She quotes the same passage from Hebrews 3, 12 through 16. And I'm taking off on the paragraph that says, Cannot we, who are living in the time of the end, realize the importance of the apostles' word? Take heed, brethren, lest there be any, in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. Upon us is shining the accumulated light of past ages. The records of Israel's forgetfulness has been preserved for our enlightenment. In this age, God has set his hand to gather unto himself a people from every nation, kindred, and tongue. In the Advent movement, he has wrought for his heritage, even as he wrought for the Israelites in leading them from Egypt. In the great disappointment of 1844, the faith of his people was tested, as was that as the Hebrews at the Red Sea. Had the Adventists in the early days still trusted to the guiding hand of, that had been with them in their past experience, they would have seen the salvation of God. If all who had labored unitedly in the work of 1844 had received the third angel's message and proclaimed it with power 
in the power of the Holy Spirit, the Lord would have wrought mightily with their efforts. A flood of light would have been shed upon the world. Years ago, the inhabitants of the earth would have been warned. The closing work would have been completed and Christ would have come for the redemption of his people. The point here is, is that she's just compared the deliverance from Egypt with the Millerite movement and she's putting that in re reference to the beginning of our confidence that we're to hold steadfast to the end. Is that an incorrect analysis of that passage? Okay, next quote, also from volume 8, page 296. This is probably a familiar one to a group like this, but it's still worth putting in the record for some of you that might be listening to these things for the first time. The enemy is seeking to divert the minds of our brethren and sisters from the work of preparing a, a people to stand in these last days. His sophistries are designed to lead minds away from the perils and duties of the hour. They estimate as of nothing the light that Christ came from heaven to give to John to his, for his people. What's the light that, that God gave to John for his people? The book of Revelation. Wow. What is it that's being... Treat it as if it's of little value. Would it be Revelation 10 and the seven thunders? Amen. How about Revelation 18 and the mighty angel come down? How about Revelation 9, the first and second woe that's illustrating the third woe in chapter 11? How, how about it? It's being esteemed as little value today as we speak. After all, we want to go into the cities and do a wonderful work. They estimate as nothing the light that Christ came from heaven to give to John for his people. They teach that the scenes just before us are if not of sufficient importance to receive special attention. Not of sufficient importance to receive special attention, yet the prophet had said no human pen can describe the magnitude of the ordeal that's before us. Amen. They make of no effect the truth of heavenly origin, and what do they do? Rob. Rob the people of God of their what? Their past experience, giving them instead a false science. Thus saith the Lord. Standing in the ways and see and ask for the old paths, where is the good way, and walk therein. Let none seek to tear away the foundations of our faith, the foundations that were laid at the beginning of our work, Amen. by prayerful study of the word and by revelation. You ever, you ever compared these charts with the 1863 chart? Have you? I'm not, I'm not being critical, but I know some of you have heard about the 1863 chart. What is it that the 1863 chart lacks compared to this. And I'm not just talking about the 2520. It, it, it lacks the commentary in the text. In other words, it lacks the ability to speak. Amen. And according to Habakkuk, these charts were to speak. Amen. If you take and everything off there except the dates, it can't speak. These charts speak. I don't know why I did that. Let me get, get focused back on. Let none seek to, weigh the, seek to tear away the foundations of our faith, the foundations that were laid at the beginning of our work by prayerful study of the word and by revelation. Upon these foundations we've been building for the last 50 years, men may suppose that they found a new way and they can lay a stronger foundation than that which has been laid, but this is a great deception. Other foundation can no man lay than that which has been laid. In the past, many have undertaken taken the building of a new faith, the establishment of new principles, but how long did the building stand? It soon fell. It was not founded upon the rock. Did not the first disciples have to meet the sayings of men? Did they not have to listen to false theories? And then having done all to stand firm, saying, other foundation can no man lay than that is laid. So we are to hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. My claim here is that Sister White here is identifying that the beginning of our confidence is the history of the Millerites, it's the, also the old past of Jeremiah. It's these truths right here that we're to hold steadfast to the end. Next quote. Battle Creek Letters, page 82. 
I am instructed to say that those who would tear away the foundation that God has laid are not to be accepted as teachers and leaders of his people. We are to hold the beginning of our covenant steadfast unto the end, words of power. And then she quotes this last word for word, this last passage. But here she says, if you're not going to stand on these foundational truths, you're not supposed to be a leader or teacher of God's people. Okay. So, next, history. I'm saying that this history here, brothers and sisters, that the reason that they refused to go into the promised land was rebellion against the rest of grace, the rest of obedience. They could have been obedient to the word of Joshua and Caleb and went right on in, but they didn't. And that the beginning here is a rebellion against a type of rest. And I'm saying a type of rest on purpose. Because when we line this up tomorrow, we're going to say that the type of rest that we're in rebellion again, against when we are repeating this history here at the end is the resting of the land every seventh year and the resting of the land in the Jubilee. We're in rebellion against the rest that is recorded in Leviticus 25 and 26. The 2520 which is the symbol of these foundational truths. It's a symbol of the argument. So, I'm saying that rest is the rest of Jeremiah 6, 16 and 17. Now we want to look at this rebellion, year day principle, at the end of Israel, when Jerusalem was destroyed. Ezekiel 4, 1 through 6. Thou also, son of man, take thee a tile, and lay it before thee, and portray upon it the city, even Jerusalem, and lay siege against it, and build a fort against it, and cast a mount against it, set the camp also against it, and set battering rams, battering rams against it round about. Moreover, take thou unto thee an iron pan, and set it for a wall of iron between thee and the city, and set thy face against it, and shall be besieged, and thou shalt lay siege against it. This shall be a sign to the house of Israel." Lie thou also upon thy left side, and lay the iniquity of the house of Israel upon it, according to the number of days that thou shalt lie upon it. Thou shalt bear their iniquity, for I have laid upon thee the years of their iniquity, according to the number of the days, three hundred and ninety days. So shalt thou bear the iniquity of the house of Israel. And when thou hast accomplished them, lie again on thy right side, and thou shalt bear the iniquity of the house of Judah forty days. I have appointed thee each day for a year. This year day principle has to do with the punishment of Jerusalem, right? Okay. The punishment of Jerusalem is accomplished by Nebuchadnezzar. And we, you can read, I have in your notes now, if you're following your notes, you can read Jeremiah 17, verses 21 through 27. This is where Jeremiah said, had they kept the seventh day Sabbath, Jerusalem would have stood forever. But I'm not going to read that passage because there's a very nice comment by the Spirit of Prophecy right underneath it where she's going to comment on these verses and you can test it later and see if I'm misrepresenting it. On one occasion, I'm on the bottom of page three of your notes, on one occasion, by, the com by command of the Lord, the prophet took his position at one of the principal entrances to the city and there urged the importance of keeping holy the Sabbath day. The inhabitants of Jerusalem were in danger of losing sight of the sanctity of the Sabbath and they were solemnly warned against following their secular pursuits on that day. A blessing was promised on condition of obedience. If you diligently hearkened to me, the Lord declared, and hallowed the Sabbath day to do no work therein, then shall there, ent shall there enter into the gates of this city kings and princes, sitting upon the throne of David, riding in chariots and on horses, they and their princes, the men of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And this city shall remain what? Forever. The enemy is seeking to divert... I'm sorry. I didn't turn it. This promise of prosperity as the reward of allegiance was accompanied by a prophecy of the terrible judgments that would befall the city should its inhabitants prove disloyal to God and His law. If the admonitions to obey the Lord God of their fathers and to hallow His Sabbath day were not heeded, the city and its palaces would be utterly destroyed by fire. Prophets and Kings 411, 412. Testimonies, Volume 5, page 160. Satan's snares are laid for us as verily as they were laid for the children of Israel just prior to their entrance into the land of Canaan. We are repeating 
the history of that people. Lightness, vanity, love of ease and pleasure, selfishness and impurity are increasing among us. There is need now of men who are firm and fearless in declaring the whole counsel of God. Men who will not sleep as other do, as, as do others, but watch and be sober. Next quote from Testimonies, Volume 1, page 608. Last paragraph. Second paragraph, she talks about them coming out of Egypt. Last paragraph says, A blessing or a curse is now before the people of God. This is us. A blessing if they come out from the world and are separate and walk in the path of humble obedience and a curse if they unite with the idolaters who trample upon the high claims of heaven. The sins and iniquities of rebellious Israel are recorded as the picture presented before us as a warning that if we imitate their example of transgression and depart from God, we shall fall as surely as did, as did they. Now all these things happened unto them for ensamples, and they are written for our ammunition upon whom the ends of the world are come. And I'm submitting to you that Numbers 14.34 is the history of the rebellion of Israel at the beginning of their time period, and they were rebelling against the rest of grace. And Ezekiel 46 is symbolic of their rebellion against the seventh-day Sabbath at the end of their history. And this is an illustration of Adventism at the end of the world that will first refuse to accept Jeremiah's rest and refuse to walk therein. And in the controversy that ensues over walking in the old paths, those people that refuse to hearken to the sound of the trumpet and walk in the old paths will be preparing a character that will be demonstrated at the Sunday Law as a character that is due to receive the mark of the beast and not the seal of God. And this is a perfect parallel to ancient Israel. Next quote is from Testimonies, Volume 4, page 166. The days of Sa- In the days of Samuel, Israel thought that the presence of the ark containing the commandments of God would gain them victory over the Philistines, whether or not they repented of their wicked works. Just so in Jeremiah's time, the Jews believed that the strict observance of the divinely appointed services of the temple would preserve them from the just punishment of their evil course. The same danger exists today among the people who profess to be the depositories of God's law. God's law. They are too apt to flatter themselves that the, that the regard in which they hold the commandments will preserve them from the power of divine justice. They refuse to be reproved for evil and charge God's servants with being too zealous for putting sin out of the camp. A sin-hating God calls upon those who profess to keep his law to depart from all iniquity. Neglect to repent and obey his word will bring a serious consequence upon God's people today as it did the same as it did upon ancient Israel. There is a limit beyond which he will no longer delay his judgments. The desolation of Jerusalem. And why was Jerusalem destroyed? Well, the first time it was because they rejected the Seventh-day Sabbath. The desolation of Jerusalem stands as a solemn warning before the eyes of modern Israel that the corrections given through his chosen instruments cannot be disregarded with impunity. When the priests and the people heard the message that Jeremiah delivered to them in the name of the Lord, they were very angry and declared that he should die. And what was the message that really got him upset? What was it? The temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord are these. And if you want to understand what that means, then go to Shiloh and figure it out. Because what happened at Shiloh was going to be repeated by Nebuchadnezzar and repeated by the Romans in AD 70. And they're all prefiguring what goes on in Adventism at the end of the world to those Seventh-day Adventists that have put some kind of false confidence in the fact that they're Seventh-day Adventists and have refused to walk in the increasing glory of the third angel's message. When the priests and the people heard the message that Jeremiah delivered to them in the name of the Lord, they were very angry and declared that he should die. They were boisterous in their denunciations of him, crying, Why hast thou prophesied in the name of the Lord, saying, This house shall be like Shiloh, and this city be desolate without inhabitant? 
All the people were gathered against Jeremiah in the house of the Lord. Thus was the message of God despised, and the servant with whom he entrusted it threatened with death. The priests, the unfaithful prophets, and the people turned in wrath upon him who would not speak to them smooth things and prophesy deceits. Brothers and sisters, it would be nice if there was a way to, to bring in various lines of presentations at certain points because you never know. You have to assume your audience hasn't heard. You have to assume they haven't heard any of them. But at this point, it would be nice to think that we were already familiar with some studies that are established truths in this message. And I know that some people don't like to hear this message. But one of them is this. One of the established truths. And some of you will be able to follow along. And if you can follow along or you can't follow along, you can test this out later. All right? When the mighty angel comes down here on September 11, 2001, it's been prefigured over and over again. It marks a separation. This is when the everlasting gospel is being accomplished in Adventism. And the everlasting gospel is the work of Christ in producing two classes of worshipers based upon the introduction of a prophetic testing message. When the mighty angel comes down, he empowers that prophetic testing message. He has a book in his hand, and you better eat it or you're going to die. You have to eat the little book. When you eat the little book, you're given a message to carry to God's people, and it causes a shaking. It's a testing message. It produces two classes of worshipers. So in this history, you'll find many, many symbolic representations of what's going on in this history. Okay? The, the drunkards of Ephraim is the foolish virgins that continue to drink the wine of Babylon at the very point in time when they should be drinking the new wine. The wise virgins are drinking the new wine. This is the history of Christ. Pharisees couldn't receive Christ's new wine because they clung to their own old wine bags. And if they were to take the new wines, it would make them explode. All right, you know that story, right? So in these histories, you'll see parallels between the wise and foolish virgins. Everybody's drinking wine, wise and foolish. The wise virgins are drinking the new wine. Foolish virgins, they're the drunkards of Ephraim that are drinking the wine of Babylon. The wise virgins are making a covenant of life, and according to Isaiah 28 and 29, the foolish virgins, they're making a covenant with death. So there's, there's two themes that go on through here. The, the wise virgins... They're building up on the foundation that's a rock. The foolish virgin's foundation is a foundation of sand. So there's these parallels between these two classes. When you see these parallels, and there are many others, then you know that right here is where, well, even a little bit before this, but this is a movement. Read it. Check it out. Check it out in the spirit of prophecy. Sister White talks about the mighty angel of Revelation 18 being a movement. The Millerite history was a movement. And in 1863, it stopped being a movement. It became a church. Amen. But when the Millerite's history, it turns back into a movement again. There's a, but there's two movements going, brothers and sisters. In this history, there's two movements going. All right. And the one movement, it's going to end up receiving the mark of the beast. Why? Because it's going to lightly esteem the Sabbath. Amen. That's one of the things. Let's read about this other movement that is a contemporary to the movement of the angel of Revelation 18. Selected Messages, Book 1, page 204. In a vision of the night, I was shown distinctly that these sentiments have been looked upon by some as the grand truths that are to be brought in and made prominent at the present time. I was shown a platform braced by solid pillars, the truths of God's word. You can take Sister White's writings and show that the platform, this is it. Okay, this, this one here, this is the platform and the pillars. But in her terminology, she was shown this platform. I was shown a platform braced by solid timbers, the truths of God's word. Someone high in responsibility in the medical work was directing this man and that man to loosen the timbers supporting this platform. Then I heard a voice saying, Where are the watchmen that ought to be standing on the walls of Zion? Are they asleep? 
This foundation was built by the master worker and will stand storm and tempest. Will they permit this man to present doctrines that deny the past experience of the people of God? Okay, the way that you destroy the platform is by introducing doctrines that destroy the Lord's deliverance of Israel out of Egypt. Destroy our memory of the signs and wonders and miracles that took place in Egypt. Destroy our understanding of the Advent movement of 1840 to 44. Introduce doctrines that do this very thing. The time has come to take decided action. Amen. When is it that the prophets are primarily speaking of? Does this include Ellen White? The time has come to take decided action. The enemy of souls has brought in to bring, sought to bring in the supposition that a great reformation was to take place among Seventh-day Adventists and that this reformation would consist in giving up the doctrines which stand as the pillars of our faith. Brothers and sisters, what's the central pillar? How many pillars were there in the sanctuary? If you go in and count them carefully, there were 69. But there was one other pillar. It's the pillar of fire, the pillar of smoke. 69 pillars, and the, seven, the 70th pillar is this pillar of fire. And who's the pillar of fire? Christ, Christ's the pillar. And those 69 pillars, what do what you suppose they're prefiguring? 69 weeks, and in that 70th week... He's going to confirm the covenant. And what he does, what's he do in the midst of the week? He's crucified. And Sister White says the cross is the central pillar. Okay, but what's the central pillar of Adventism? 2300 days, Daniel 8, 14. That's Christ in the judgment. And brothers and sisters, we're going to show you tomorrow if you're willing to see. If you throw out the 2520, you're throwing out that pillar. You're accepting a doctrine that denies the past experience of the people of God and it destroys the platform of Adventism. And I would, I would appreciate it for those men and women that are certain that I'm teaching error that you go ahead and put together the let's say at the Lord's that demonstrate for anyone that wants to see why this is erroneous and leave off worrying about who and what I or other speakers may be. Do your responsibilities as defenders of the flock of God and demonstrate from the Bible and spirit of prophecy why these things that are being taught are incorrect. I might even receive counsel if you could prove that what we're understanding is incorrect. I've been proved wrong many, many times in 20 years. So far, I'm willing to take the correction and run with it. Because I've known from the very beginning, I don't know anything about the Word of God except He tell it to me. And sometimes I misunderstand it. And it takes another human being or another providence to show me that I'm wrong. So brothers and sisters, these, these claims about characters, instead of thus saith the Lord, they shouldn't even be in this discussion. But I'm out of the quote. Let's get back in the quote. All right which stand as the pillars of our faith and engaging in a process of reorganization. Were this reformation to take place, what, what would result? The principles of truth that God in his wisdom has given to the remnant church would be discarded. Our religion would be changed. The fundamental principles that have sustained the work for the last 50 years would be accounted as error. A new organization would be established. Books of a new order would be written. I will make the claim. I, I know what most of you believe that have looked at this quote. I know that you would claim that... Um, Kellogg's book on pantheism is the first book of a new order. I don't think that's it. That one got burned. I think the first books of the new order was written by W.W. W. Prescott in 1919 called The Doctrine of Christ, which gutted all these truths out of the Advent message and was perpetuated down to this very time period. But... Books of a new order would be written. A system of intellectual philosophy would be introduced. That's where we're at today, brothers and sisters. A system of intellectual philosophy. You have to be trained in the, in the biblical languages and trained in the biblical history. 
If you're trained, then you're intellectual, and you can explain it to those of us that aren't intellectual. Amen. It's been introduced, it's been established. Amen. William means protector. Amen. Warren is a pen where you keep the animals in the barnyard. And Prescott means the priest's cottage. William Warren Prescott, W.W. W. Prescott, he's the one that established the two two-class system in Adventism of the priest's cottage ruling over the sheep in the pen. Amen. You have to have that system if Isaiah 29 is going to be fulfilled because when Isaiah 29 is fulfilled, when the book's given to those that are learned, those in the priest's cottage, they say, I can't understand the book for it's sealed. And then it's given to the, the, the sheep in the pen and they say, I can't understand that book unless it's taught to me by one of the priests. Okay, that wasn't the original structure of Millerite Adventism. All ye are brethren. Okay, it gets changed by books of a new order and intellectual philosophy. And I know this might seem pointed, but brothers and sisters, until God's people shake off their lethargy and see where they're at, they don't have even a, a chance to get out of this trap we're in. It's a trap, brothers and sisters. Final movements are rapid ones. Probation closes as an overwhelming surprise. Money will be devaluated very quickly. Brothers and sisters, we're on the verge of a great crisis, and the last thing we need now is a peace and safety message. Amen. Amen. And that's the only thing you can give in this time period if you're not given the message. is a peace and safety message. Now notice, the founders of this system would go into the cities and do a wonderful work. Whoa. The Sabbath would be lightly regarded. Right here. If you're lightly regarding the Sabbath as you head into this history, the Sunday law, you're preparing for the mark of the beast. As also the God who created it. Nothing would be allowed to stand in the way of the new movement, brothers and sisters. Wrap your mind around that one. I have, I have dealt with some of the, for me, and I'm not an example of anything, but I've told brothers before, I can think of one brother in Germany, saying, I know you can set up a meeting with those men, but it's not going to accomplish anything. No, I think it would, I think it would. Okay, I don't think it would, but you need to learn this lesson, so let's go have this meeting with these men on this message. And when you have the meeting with these men, it blows up. The sooner we realize this sentence is true, the better off we are. Nothing will be allowed to stand in the way of this movement, according to inspiration. The leaders would teach that virtue is better than vice, but God being removed they would place their dependence upon human power. What's human power? What's another word for human? Secular. Secular, that's human power. Secular power. What's the definition of the image of the beast given in the spirit of prophecy? Well, it's when secular power is used to enforce or sustain religious decrees or dogmas. When human power is used to enforce religious dogmas, religious decrees. That's the image of the beast, Right? in the spirit of prophecy, they would place their dependence on human power, which without God is worthless. Their foundation would be built on sand and storm and tempest would sweep away their structure. What's the storm and tempest in God's word? It's a Sunday law, brothers and sisters. It's a storm that comes out of the north, king of the north. Who has authority to begin such a movement? We have our Bibles. We have our experience attested to by the miraculous working of the Holy Spirit. We have the truth that admits of no compromise. Shall we not repudiate everything that is not in harmony with this truth? Yes, we should. We have to do it with a very Christ-like fashion. Unfortunately, as Laodiceans, we're not necessarily too familiar with what a Christ-like fashion is. I learned when I became a Seventh-day Adventist, this, this isn't biblical, but I've seen the principle hold true. You're either feeding on Christ or you're feeding 
upon Christ's children. And as Laodiceans, the testimony of God's word is that we haven't been feeding on Christ. Amen. We've been feeding on one another. We've been looking to self, ourself, other selves. And then when this crisis comes and we start to try to figure out what's right and wrong in this great crisis, then we start raising the issue, well, is that person handling himself like Christ or not? And I submit to you, we better be careful about how we determine what Christ is. We're Laodiceans. We haven't been following Christ close enough to be certain how Christ would handle in these crisis situations. I seem to remember stories when he walked into the temple and kicked the tables over. Had a whip in his hand. And he said, you generation of vipers. And you know something, brothers and sisters? This is the generation of vipers. Do you know why it's the generation of vipers? Not because Christ or John the Baptist was being mean-spirited. But of course, they're all pointing forward to our day and age. It's because this is the everlasting gospel. And in fourth generation, it's where the two classes are developed in the everlasting gospel. And one class, according to Genesis 3.15, is the seed of Satan, the generation of vipers. And the other class is the seed of Christ. Okay, we're in the generation where you're either developing the image of Christ or the image of the beast. This is the generation of vipers in Adventism. And we best understand that. We need to hear that message, brothers and sisters. Switching gears now. Okay, I'll summarize what I've said. I have 12 minutes. I thought when I was coming here, I was only getting an hour for a presentation. So when I came up here and see I had an hour and a half, I thought... Oh, I have lots of time, and I've wasted all my time. I'm not going to get through all this. <laughs> the rebellion at the promised land is a rebellion that's marked on the rejection of the rest of grace, prevented God's people from going into the promised land. I'm saying that this rebellion corresponds to the rejection of the rest of the old paths in Jeremiah 6.16. And it leads to the end of ancient Israel, which is the rejection of not the rest of grace, but the rest of the seventh-day Sabbath. I'm emphasizing that it's always about a rest, this rebellion. I'm making this point, and this is the Sunday law. When this is fulfilled in our day and age, I'm making this point to set up tomorrow's presentation where we show you that Leviticus 25 and 26 is the first mention of the year-day principle in terms of those two. It comes before. Leviticus comes before, right? And it's marking the rebellion of God's people at the end of the world. But now I want to switch gears. Some of you may know these quotes. I'm going to suggest here that in this history, this is 9-11. That's not a very good 9, but that's what it is. This is the Sunday law. That in this history, there will be three tests for Adventism. And it's sad that Seventh-day Adventists don't understand that because these three tests, look at how many places just in this part of the chain it's illustrated. 3-1, 3-1, 3-1, 3-1. There's a 3-1 in the time of Christ that isn't on here. 3-1 here in the time of the Millerites. All the prophets are speaking about the end of the world. We're going <laughs> to... Who's our example? Who's our example in all things? When Christ went into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil, was he tempted four times, two times? Three times. What was his first test? Pardon me? Eat the little book. Wasn't it? Man shall not live by bread alone. The first test is whether you're going to eat the word of God or not. Isn't that the first test? That was the empowerment of the first test in the Millerite time period. It's the first test for us. There's three tests in Adventism. Now notice this next quote. I'm not going to quote Revelation 18. 14. I'm, I'm just going to read beyond that. It says, The first, second, and third angels' messages are to be repeated. Then down to the next paragraph. Many who went forth to meet the bridegroom under the message of the first and second angels refused the third, the last testing message to be given to the world. And a similar position will be taken when the last call is made. You see that she's applying the three angels' messages again at the end of the world and she's connecting it with the parable of the ten virgins. And if you don't know the significance of that, if you move over to the next page, I'll back up and catch the ones I'm passing over, but on the next page you see Great Controversy 393 that says the parable of the ten virgins of Matthew 25 also illustrates the experience of the Adventist people. And if you drop down to the, the, 
the sentence that's in the bold face in this quote from Great Controversy. It says, here is brought to view the church living in the last days. The church living in the last days has been illustrated by the parable of the ten virgins. Who's God's church living in the last days? We are. So if you back up to the previous quote, she's just compared Revelation 14. She's connected Revelation 14 with the parable of the ten virgins and said the three angels' messages are going to be repeated. And she also said that these are three testing messages. Okay, three tests. There was three tests. Read, read early writings, page 259, brothers and sisters. The Millerites had three tests, just like the time of Christ. There were three tests. We're repeating that history. We have three tests. Okay, so the next quote from Great Controversy 389, I've moved back to page six now, where it says perfect fulfillment yet future. It says the Bible declares that before the coming of the Lord, Satan will work with pow all power and signs and lying wonders and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness. And they that receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved will be, be left to receive strong delusion that they should be leave alive. Brothers and sisters, I know that even people that are sympathetic to the things that I believe, that I give them heartburn when I say what I'm going to say here. Okay? But I'm going to say it anyway. Sooner or later, someone's going to either figure out to sh how to show me that I'm wrong, or they're going to get it. Second Thessalonians, the truth, the primary truth that's being discussed there is the truth that William Miller recognized when he saw the relationship between paganism and papalism. The truth that they will not receive is the truth of the daily. Now, it's all truth in general. I'm just saying the daily is a symbol of gadol, self-exaltation, an unwillingness to accept those foundational truths. And if you have gadol, and how is it that you get rid of gadol, which is the Hebrew word for self-exaltation that's mentioned several times in Daniel 8 where the daily is referenced? If we all have gadol, right? We all have self-exaltation. That's our heritage, right? How is it that we get gadol removed? Well, according to these charts, it's to come to the foot of the cross on both of these charts. You come to the foot of the cross, the only way you can get it out. But if you refuse to recognize that truth in 2 Thessalonians, the love of that truth, then you receive strong delusion. Not until this condition. What condition? The strong delusions of 2 Thessalonians. Not until this condition shall be reached and the union of church with the world shall be fully accomplished throughout Christendom will the fall of Babylon be complete. The fall of Babylon, it began in the Millerite history, but it's not complete until our day and age. The change is a progressive one and the perfect fulfillment of Revelation 14.8 is yet future. So the fall of Babylon in the Millerite history, it was progressive. It wasn't perfect. It was typifying. The first, second, and third angel's message that was fulfilled in the Millerite history was just typifying the perfect fulfillment in our day and age. And in the Millerite history, when the third test arrived, the door closed into the holy place. The door closed in the parable of the ten virgins. And we're going to fulfill the parable of the ten virgins. There's a door that closes on us at the third message, just like there was a door that closed for the Millerites at the third message. Next quote, Select the Messages, book 2, page 104. I'll just read that one bold-faced sentence because I'm running out of time. There cannot be a third without a first and a second. <laughs> These people in Adventism that want to say probation closes for every human being on planet Earth at the same time. There's no biblical or spirit of prophecy justification for that whatsoever. That's, that's decided blindness. Okay, It's decided blindness. But more than that, it's the third angel's message. It's the Sunday law. Amen. If you say, oh, the, all we got to do, deal with is the Sunday law. If you're not one of those that says probation closes for everyone, but you're, you're one of those that says, oh, the only test is the Sunday law test. Well, brothers and sisters, Sister White says there cannot be a third test without a first and a second. She says it right here, black and white. There cannot be a third without a first and a second. We've already referenced the next quote from Great Controversy 393. The parable of the ten virgins of Matthew 25 also illustrates the experience of the Adventist people. The next quote, Review and Herald, 
I don't know why August 19th, 1895 isn't on there. I left that out. I think it's 1895 or 1890, but it's referring to the parable of the ten virgins. And it says, I'm often referred to the parable of the ten virgins, five of whom were wise and five foolish. This parable has been and will be fulfilled to the very letter. Okay, now, if you know the parables, Christ object lessons, where Sister White lays out the parables, brothers and sisters, that is absolutely 150% present truth for our day and age. The parables are telling what's going on in Adventism right now. Because right now the everlasting gospel is being accomplished in Adventism. And the everlasting gospel is the work of Christ in producing two classes of worshipers based upon a, the introduction of a prophetic testing message. And the parables are always about two classes of worshipers. Okay, so I, I, the next quote, I'm going to drop to the last quote because I want to qualify this for those people that are purposely trying to be blind. Drop to the last quote on page 7. It says, There have always been wheat, there have been and always will be tares among the wheat. You know that parable? The parable of the wheat and tares? The foolish virgins with the wise. Those who have no oil in their vessels with lamps. What did Sister White just do grammatically and prophetically? She says the tares are the foolish virgins and the wheat are the wise virgins, right? They're interchangeable terms. Amen? Amen. Okay, now let's back up to the next quote. This is, this is for the brethren in Newport that haven't let the truth about the close of probation settle into their hearts and minds yet. What is this next quote? The previous quote from Christ Object Lessons, page 123. Both the parable of the tares and that of the net plainly teach that there's no time when all the wicked will turn to God. The wheat and the tares grow together until the harvest. Now who's the wheat and the tares? Wise and foolish. The good and bad fish are together drawn ashore for the final separation. Again, these parables teach that there is no probation after the judgment. Whoa. Now, some people admit that judgment begins with Adventism. It begins with the house of God. But they're unwilling to admit that the spirit of prophecy right here says there is no probation after judgment. That's what it says crazy to say otherwise. Like I said, I sent these notes on a couple weeks ago or whatever, so I don't have it in front of me. Write this down. Bible Training School, January 1st, 1904. You know what she teaches in Bible Training School, January 1st, 1904? She says, this is what you type down, type in if you want to pull it up on the Ellen White CD ROM. The world can only be warned. Type those words in. The world can only be warned. You follow me? You know what she says after that? The world can only be warned by seeing men and women with the seal of God during the Sunday law testing time. Now, Now how is it that everyone receives this seal at the same time? I guess the world doesn't get saved. Because the only warning for the world in the Sunday Law crisis is to see Seventh-day Adventists that already have the seal of God, according to inspiration. But we're thinking that probation closes for everyone at the same time, at the end of the world. And brothers and sisters, that's the perfect definition for a peace and safety message. The Bible says, surely the Lord thy God will do nothing except he reveal it through his servants, the prophets. Do you think he's going to bring his people, his modern Israel, to the time period where they're either going to receive the seal or the mark, and he's not going to warn them, warning, warn them that that time period is here? Well, if you believe that, you really don't know much about the character of Christ. He doesn't do anything that he doesn't warn his people in advance. And what's more serious than that? The close of probation upon his people. You... You could. I'm going to give you some references. I have to close. Okay. All right. I did lose my notes. Okay, you can have your notes back. I had some references up here for this point in time, and I'm one minute over time, so I'm just going to give them to you. Uh, 
turn to Psalms 147, verse 2. We'll move quickly. I know some of you have come from far. You've got to go home far. Uh, let, me, let, me, let, me, let, me, let me do one thing first. All right. I, have several, I have three biblical arguments to prove that probation closes first for Seventh-day Adventists. Jeremiah 25, 15 through 18. Jeremiah is given the cup of God's wrath, wrath and he's told, go to the nations and make the nations drink. And the first place he goes through is Jerusalem. Yeah. Ezekiel 9. Begin with the ancient men that stood before the church. Put with that Testimonies, Volume 5, about page 210. All right? It begins with Adventism. Judgment begins with the house of God. I'll pass over the references that I was going to make because I just want to share one thing. I read a, a statement from a church in this community here. And they had three doctrinal arguments and a fourth point. And one of the doctrinal arguments was a denial that probation closes at the Sunday Law for Seventh-day Adventists. All right. The other was the 2520, and brothers and sisters, the 2520 is the symbol of the first test for Adventism because it symbolizes the return to the old past. And the other doctrinal argument that they're rejecting is the daily. And the daily is about whether you're going to retain your self-exaltation or you're going to have it taken away at the foot of the cross. It's the second test. So in that letter, you find the very three tests that have been outlined in God's word, are the three doctrines that are being rejected. Amen. And that's pretty disappointing. But the fourth one, the fourth point, fourth angel's message is where the power comes, is it not? This is where the power is in that letter. Because the fourth point is a call to submit to church authority. It's a three-one combination in that letter. And it's astounding how it's opposing this message and walking in the very blueprint of this message, which is the three-one combination, as it does so. So I understand we have questions and answers at this time, but I think we ought to close with prayer and those that have to go can go, right? Heavenly Father, we wish to hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. But as Laodicean Christians at the end of the world, we must admit that we don't have a complete and thorough knowledge of, of the signs and the miracles, the wonders that were accomplished as you brought your people out of Babylon in the Millerite movement, but that we have a work to do to go back and investigate that history. And while we're investigating it, we see that it's coming under attack. We recognize that we're in, incapable of uh, defending and clarifying these issues on our own and that we need your wisdom. We need your spirit to guide and direct in our studies and in our interaction with other souls that are making decisions at this time. We ask that as we do share, that we will do so in a way that you can endorse in a way that you can empower through the presence of your Holy Spirit and that in no way we would um, disgrace you by our actions. And it's a difficult task for this is a serious message. And this is serious times, not only in God's church, but in the world. We ask that as we proceed in our studies this Sabbath, tomorrow, when we come back, that you would bring us back refreshed, but that you'd help us to put these truths in proper perspective. And as we part tonight, we pray for those in this community that are arraying themselves against this message, that no doubt think they're arraying themselves against some of the human beings that are in this meeting right here. And according to my understanding, they're not understanding that they're arraying themselves against you. Amen. We ask that you'd forgive them, that you'd give them a moment of grace, that they can rethink, restudy these things, that they can get back upon the foundation that you've built, the foundation that's upon the rock, that they don't have to be 
uh, standing upon that foundation that gets swept away in storm and tempest. We thank you for the Sabbath. We ask that you bless our time together and take us home safely now in Jesus' name. Amen.